I think. Are we live? Uh, yes, I think. It didn't tell us. So, it, I see. It's just like gone and it, we are live. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to be here. Welcome to Grow with Katie live at Homestead Gardens. And I'm really excited to welcome my guest, Daryl Chang from Houseplant Journal. Hi, Daryl. How are you today? Hey, Katie. Good. How Great. How are you? So, Daryl. Daryl and I, Daryl's my guinea pig. Thank you, Daryl, for being a guinea pig. You're always up for trying new things mm -hmm. um, because we are broadcasting with trying something new out. So what we'd like for you guys out there to let us know first, I see there's two people. So the two of you, oh, there's four. Okay, we're growing, but let us know. Can you hear us? How do we look? How do we sound? Um, is there anything we can do to improve this experience? Because Daryl and I are both new at this, so... Awesome. Well, it looks like we've got someone. Can you see the comments, Daryl? Uh, no. Okay. Well, actually, for me, the comments say uh, you don't have access to comments or reaction from viewers. Okay, cool. Well, that's okay. Well, then I'll keep you updated on what people say. Uh, sure. But people are tuning in. And yeah, as you're tuning in and letting us know that you can hear us and see us, let us know where you're from. So we've got a Delaware in the house. Um, and so that's great. And I know Homestead Gardens is based outside of Baltimore um, in the D.C. region. So they're in Severna Park and Davidsonville, the two locations. So I'm sure we're going to have some people from that region here. Uh, where do you live? I'm in Toronto, Canada. Pretty far from us. So do you guys have snow on the ground? I'm not that familiar with Toronto's. Uh, right right now there's no snow, but I think uh, in the little bit more northern regions of the wider city, there's there's some snow there. But overall, it's actually been quite a mild winter. Yeah, it has for us too. We got a big storm back in December, but then it's been super mild as well. But our house plants don't really care about that, do they? No, 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 they don't. <laughs> Uh, they get to enjoy the indoors uh, temperature with you, so they are very happy and, uh, yeah, not No, <laughs> and that's what we're going to be talking about, obviously, with the houseplant journal himself, um, about houseplants today. So um, I'm really excited because this is going to be different. We've been talking houseplants all week. Just, Daryl, if you didn't know, we talked with Hilton oh, Carter nice. two weeks ago and then your friend Summer Rain last week. So we've been celebrating Houseplant Month, I guess is what we're calling January. Um, and they both talked about kind of different things that we want to focus on today. It was amazing, Daryl, how many questions we got about um, lights and about how to provide the proper lighting for your mm -hmm. plants. And I kept telling people, tune in on the 18th, <laughs> we're gonna be talking all about lights, but you have some interesting new tidbits to share about certain lights and how you to provide the best lighting for your plants. So we're gonna jump into that. Um, but let me introduce Daryl if you don't know him. Um, to say that your relationship with plants is unique because you didn't start out as um, a plant geek, I should say, as you have evolved, you have a background in engineering and in technology, right? Mm -hmm. So you found plants by way of um, your, uh, parent, your my mother? My parents just said, yeah. like, help me decorate the house with some house plants. And I just said, okay. And, uh, and I said, okay, I guess I'll have to figure out how to take care of them. And that's really how Houseplant Journal began. I mean, I mean, of course, luckily that house that we used to live at had two beautiful skylights. Mm -hmm. So everything worked out quite well for me over there. And that's, I mean, but of course, I think one of the major things to talk about is like a lot of times, you know, we look at houseplants as almost like a reflection of our skill of growing, right? And I mean, to some degree, that's true. But we also have to recognize that to, a, to an even more important degree, your environmental conditions kind of like dictate how well the plants will grow. And then it's up to you to sort of realize that potential, right? So that's why I talk about light and I say, and the way I describe it is, you know, light dictates the total growth potential that your plant has, but you as the caretaker have to water, fertilize, repot and all that to in order to realize that potential. Now, that's right. yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, I say it very philosophically like that, but I mean, in a very practical sense, it means that if actually, yes, even I have moved now to a different place my windows are smaller. There's buildings outside that block the sun, all this stuff. The whole environment has changed, which means I cannot expect my plants to look the same way that they did when I used to live with a big skylight. Even though you might even have the same plant, the exact same plant, not just the same variety. You yeah. know, you take them from one place to another and now the whole right. thing changes. And, and so this, like, this, is, this comes to sort of like the first point that you brought up, which is, uh, I mean, in, in your email to me, which is about the sort of, perfectionist and like why what about the like niceness of the plant and it's to say that I prefer to look at plants as, as having like they're going to grow into your space so mm -hmm. one should not 
like hope that they would look like somebody else's on Instagram, for example. Um, but that, you know, recognizing that your plant's going to grow into your space and it will look uniquely like the way that your space provides. And of course, combining it with your care and all that. So stuff. I love that. So if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, Daryl, what I like to say is he's coined the ugly plant movement. Yeah, you might have heard of the ugly fruit movement where we are embracing fruits and vegetables that don't look perfect. And that's, I, I love that because if you grow a garden and if you likely follow Homestead Gardens on Facebook, you probably have an edible garden. You pull a carrot out of the ground. Sometimes it's intertwined with the other carrot. Our tomatoes don't look perfect like we do in the grocery store. And that's what we love. And I think you've really done this for houseplants. You've helped people realize that the Instagram perfect um, houseplant is not true. That houseplant in the bathroom where you look around, you see no windows in that room. That is not reality. That is yeah, not true. And Daryl, you're helping people. Some understand. magazine that they just place right. them there, right? <laughs> yeah. And you're helping people understand understand that uh, a brown leaf on your plant can be natural. Yes, it can also be an indicator of a problem, but I really think that um, that's a wonderful thing. So how did you, I mean, it it's a little bit brave to break from the pack and start sharing about not only these ugly, you know, they're not really ugly, they're beautiful, mm -hmm. we see that, but, um, and also to share things that weren't necessarily Instagram perfect. Yeah. What I made you want to do that? Well, I think even just thinking about the, the, the movement about like imperfect fruits and vegetables, the idea is basically that for, for decades, we have, you know, if, if you just, if you only encounter fruits and vegetables at the supermarket, then you're kind of like got the wool over your eyes, meaning you are only seeing the super perfect ones. You don't even know what happens at the, uh, at the distribution center where they're like, yeah, this one this is a great A, this is a B, this is a C, you know, that kind of, which actually happens. I'm not just yeah. making this up. Like, I'm sure you understand this happens. So then by the time you get to the grocery store, you're only looking at the perfect ones. So you always think, oh, uh, carrots are always perfectly straight and about yay long and whatever, right? So then that same effect is happening with houseplants. But in a sense, with food, we have this sort of, like you could call it like a higher philosophy to say like, you know, because it has to do with our, our literally our sustenance, maybe we shouldn't be so superficial about it. But with plants, it's like, we understand this is just, it's just decor or it's just having plants around. So it's not quite as critical to realize that this is the case. But then what happens is then when you see a yellow leaf, when you see a brown tip, if it's not perfect, you think therefore must, something must mm -hmm. be wrong. And then you go looking mm -hmm. for the answers and trying to fix things, right? So I guess what I've been trying to do with Houseplant Journal is like show, show what does it really look like to live with, let's say, like, for example, today's post, this Monstera. What does it look like to live with this Monstera for the past seven years, right? And of course, recognizing that it's in that space that it had like really basically like a French door on one side and north, huge yeah. north facing window on the other side. So this is what it, it comes out and it grew very nicely for me for maybe three or four years. And then the yellowing started happening. The lowest leaves started yellowing one by one. And then, yeah. So then of course, you know, you write a longer story with this plant by, okay, taking, cutting off the top or something like that. And it's like trying to say that your journey with your plant is going to look very different and there's no need to sort of like beat yourself up each time a leaf yellows. There's no need to beat yourself up every time like your tips turn brown. In fact, I even, I even look at brown tips and I, and it actually now in my mind registers more like, like wrinkles or scars on a person's face. Oh, like, oh like, I love it's, it. It's just, you know, the older your leaf is, the more transpiration is had to do. And unfortunately your water is your water and it's going to contain whatever, you know, minerals and such. So it's going to wear out those cells eventually. So I see brown tips as like the marks of hard work and, this, this also comes to the whole, like people posting yellow leaf and saying, and like repeating what I say, which is like, thank you for photosynthesis. It's like saying like, I look at these leaves as it's their time to retire. And their the leaf gradually turns yellow because of, uh, you know, chlorosis, pulling out all the mobile nutrients that whatever, until the leaf just naturally just falls off. Some plants, you have to cut it off. Like for example, a piece lily, it's a little harder to pull them out. Mm -hmm. But like pothos, monstera, they just come right off very easily. And so rather than pulling it off and look at it with a, a sort of look of, oh my gosh, what's going on? I'm like, this is the leaf that has retired. It's, it's time to retire. And so thank you for 
the years that I've had with it. I, there was a post where I, I managed to time lapse the yellowing of one of my monstera leaves. And then I was able to, because I've taken so many pictures of my plants, I, I was able to trace back the moment when I first came across that leaf. And it, it was about two years ago. So like, I'm sort of like saying, okay, so the monstera, that monstera leaf had a lifespan of roughly two years. And since that two years, you know, yeah. five more have grown, right? So it's like the overall plant uh, is going to continue growing despite all the leaves that it loses before. And that's just the way that nature grows. Like nature includes both growth and decay. We cannot just think that, mm -hmm. you know, nature is only growing. And if anything decays, something must be fixed. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's I think, uh, a, a problematic way of looking at it. That's a very Instagram way of looking. Everything has to be perfect all the time. And I love that. This is turning into a very philosophical conversation that life is about life and death and not necessarily that your plant is dying, but that leaf has given you everything. Two years with one Monstera leaf. And I love your thought process of being mm -hmm. thankful. And But how do we know, I mean, how can you differentiate for someone who's not you when a leaf is yellowing and it's the natural process of it aging or when there's a problem? So this, it, okay, this again, like when you say if it's not me, but then it's this, this little observation still requires the experience of, okay, so same example, Monstera. Uh, the vine that I had cut off, each, each vine only holds onto a certain number of leaves and then eventually the, the later ones mm -hmm. fall off, right? So I've seen Monstera, single vine Monsteras with 12 or more leaves on it. My own Monstera here, I counted roughly on the on the old plant. Each vine had about eight leaves, which which is great. Then when I took this cutting, after about two years of being in a really small pot, hint, it's because of the small pot, but it it was on its fifth leaf, and the and the last one already started yellowing. And I'm like, hmm, that's weird. Your other vine, you, you used to be sort of like you used to have a lot more let's call it capacity to to hold on to leaves. Why are you already dying with only? four leaves, right? Not, lo and behold, I was like, oh yeah, I didn't change the pot yet. And when I took out that pot, man, it was so root bound. Like, you know, mm -hmm. when the roots get into that really tight mass. Um, yeah. And so that was clearly the reason why. And of course, the only reason I was able to know that is because I based it on previous experience with right. the same plant having right. more leaves before. Yeah. So we We've got a question, but hold on, Heather. We'll get you one second. And hi, uh, Lisa Steinkoff is saying oh, hello, <laughs> a fellow houseplant lover. Hey, Lisa and Matt. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm here with Daryl Chang of, Chang of the Houseplant Journal. So um, you just talked about, and I just lost my train of thought. But um, so you were asking me how how do I know if it's something wrong or or not? Right. Versus, yeah. yeah. So. I love, and I just love your your process of observation. You know, Daryl is saying that he he observes the plants over time, and that's you know you are living with mm -hmm. living things, so they will change and observe over time, and that kind of gets into your ABCs of plants a little bit, which I love that so much. Um, would you tell people what those sure, are? Sure, sure. So so it's like, let let's say, in our current way of looking at plants, you could argue that that when you when you read marketing speak about any kind of house plants. It mostly seems like they're saying, here's a piece of decor, but you have to maintain it, right? Um, and then sometimes we add in, oh, by the way, did you know they clean the air? And like, it's basically trying to get you to buy them, right? But it's like, for me, you don't need to tell me that they clean the air in order for me to, to want to have plants around, right? So it's like, I've sort of expanded like, okay, what are exactly the different facets of ways to appreciate plants, especially with houseplants? Mm -hmm. And that is the ABC of houseplant appreciation. So the A, the A stands for uh, aesthetics because we like the fact that they're beautiful, right? B is for biology. Like we appreciate just how fascinating that this living thing just is able to grow in a totally different way from animals, right? And that's something that you can kind of like marvel at when you, when you have them with you. And then C is for companionship. And that is, you know, you develop a real connection with them. Like, because if I talk to you about the staghorn fern, I can tell you stories and stories of, of this life of the staghorn fern or this monster right here, right? So it is to say that that means if you were to just swap it and replace it with another staghorn fern, it wouldn't be the same one. It wouldn't be this one. 
that has grown with me. So that is a real thing that you get to appreciate. Like I call it like having a botanical friend, right? You have plants, if you had them long enough, there's always going to be a story with it. And that's something that's uh, really, I think, beautiful that everybody can love- have. That. And last time we talked, you told me about your book. Daryl has a book, The New Plant Parent, and the story of the pilea on the cover, right? Isn't it a yeah, pilea? Yeah. And you said, of course, at that moment, it looked beautiful. And then you showed it to me, and it was going through a, a not-so-beautiful stage. But that book, that plant means so much to you because that was your cover girl. And, you know, that there's you're right, that connection that we have to the plant, uh, especially, I think, uh, just the way that we care about them. You mentioned how much you photograph your plants, you know, and it reminded me of children. Yeah, and we really totally. do embrace that love of the plant. And you're right. You were, of course, we get a new plant baby and we love that one, but those connections are being still being formed. So that's beautiful. Tell us your stories, you guys out there. Tell us one of your, your plant love stories I, about a connection that you have with a plant. I think what's really, really starting to come to light too is like, like basically like what I would call heirloom plants where they are literally passed down from generation. And I love hearing those stories. I have one or two, I think, I don't know if they're here or with my parents, but like not passed down from my relatives, but, but the person who said, Oh, my grandmother gave me this one. And so Nehar, I'll give you a piece of it now too. So mm-hmm. it was just a random plant person that I met. And, but that's like, you get to continue that story. And I mean, hopefully I'll be able to continue that story with some of these plants. I love that. The heirloom idea of houseplants. I am going to save that up here for something. I love now, that so much. I will also say though this, heir, the idea of heirloom houseplants now brings to light the, the idea. There are some plants whose sort of like appeal can, can last generations, right? Mm-hmm. Whether that be because it keeps producing pups like a pilea or whether that because, for example, a monstera, like that vine can just keep growing longer and longer. And once you get to like the 20th leaf and the rest of it's bare, just chop that piece and bring it back, right? Like the, the sort of longevity of different plants um, can, be, can be sort of like, <laughs> I call it the horticultural horcrux if you're like Harry Potter, like different ways to, to keep extending yes. the life of that plant. Oh, I love that. Um, so we all right. Let's go to the question from Heather. She said, "Have you heard of Pure Crop, crop One?" Pure, pure Crop One. Yeah, Pure Crop One. Um, Heather, maybe you can tell us more. She's asking me about it specifically in in relation to prevention and treatment. No, I guess Daryl doesn't know about it. Pure, pure and the number one. One. Oh, is it, is it is it the name of a maybe a pesticide or something like that? It must be. Okay, I. I've never heard of it either. Literally never heard of it. Yeah, Heather, tell us about it. And uh, maybe it's something new that we can, we can explore. My um, one thing too with, with pesticides is that, you know, the availability varies by country because every country has different restrictions on, you know, whatever safety yeah. and whatever. So for example, in Canada, as a consumer, I'm not allowed to buy systemic insecticides. Yeah. Uh, only, only, I think, uh, licensed insecticide applicators can can yep. do it meaning like at a nursery yep yeah that's a good point that might be why heather pure crop, crop one if you're curious you can go to home and ask them about it um all right well let's jump into uh, well first you have some courses that i want to tell people about because they're really exciting you have is it one course or how many courses do you have now? yeah so it's yep. one course and it's called uh, essentials of houseplant enjoyment and that's sort of the name i just kind of th- thought of at the moment but like basically i if i was to really boil down what the what it's about. It's like this. If you could imagine if you were to sit down with me for about, uh, let's say three or four hours of me just telling you, like giving you a foundational understanding of how to go about uh, not only just caring for plants, but even just the mindset of enjoying houseplants, uh, that, then that's what this course awesome. is about. And so that's the main part. And then of course the bonus thing is that I do these zoom calls with the students. So wow. right now I've done like approximately two a month since the time of the, the starting of the course, which means there's an additional like 10 hours wow. of other material where I do like extra little bits and pieces of more kind of knowledge based things, but then also answering people's direct questions. And I think the the strength of that is, you know, when you try and Google something or even when you watch a YouTube video, the person might not be answering the question exactly as you're asking it because they're not able to look at your space. They're not able to ask you 
you know, it's the, the funniest thing I'm always thinking about in terms of the idea of overwatering. It's like, why do you need to look at the leaf in order to diagnose overwatering? Why don't I just ask you, hey, tell me how often you're watering this? <laughs> Anyway, right. So, and there's so many issues. I mean, you, I could have a, you know, whatever, a Sansevieria and say, this is my problem. Let me Google yellowing leaves. But you're right. Inevitably, it's, there's going to be, first of all, 5,000 different answers, mm -hmm. um, all from different places. And so I do love that concept. So we just posted a link to it. So you guys can check that out. Um, of course, Homestead is a great place to go in and diagnose your plant problems. Uh, take your plants there. And we had a commenter earlier, Peggy Ann said she loves to drive down and go there in the winter time to spend time in their greenhouse because like I shared tour. last week some Escape, images. Right? It is like a tropical <laughs> vacation. Yes, it is absolutely beautiful. I know they've got a ton of new plants, so uh, house plants specifically. So go go mm. ahead and visit. Um, all right, let's let's talk about lighting. Yes. So let's jump into it because I know you guys have a lot of questions. So I have a bunch too, but go ahead and shoot us your questions. So we'll get your questions answered as well. So the first one is let's unpack those words bright indirect light. So what the heck does that mean? <laughs> all right. So so let's 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 ignore even the words at all entirely and just talk about it as if you asked me where is the best place to put the plant indoors, right? Where should I put it? Then my first inclination as an engineer was to say, okay, I have a bunch of plants. Why don't I just measure the light that it gets and then over time, see whether the plant is growing well. So when I had the place with the skylight, I realized, okay, after six months, I can say that this is pretty good lighting condition for these plants. And then I would measure the light. I've, I've been measuring the light basically every day for different times of the day. And then sort of like say, okay, well, what, what is the intensity of the light right now? Now, the reason that's different is because if I just said to you, bright and direct light or an hour of sun, it's like, but you're missing a big chunk of that uh, issue of light, which is that, okay, you have moments when the sun shines on it, that's very strong light, but then what happens when the sun is not shining? There's a huge, actually a very wide range of intensity in that, and the, and the problem is your eyes are automatically adjusting to every different light level, so you can see clearly if the measured light intensity is 20 foot candles or 2000 foot candles, it, it actually physically looks the same to you. Of course, your people wow. were dilated and whatever, but all that stuff. But the point is, if I just say one word and try and describe a huge range, what happens? Then you, it registers in your mind as being like, okay, this is not that big of a deal, right? On the other hand, if I told you, okay, when the sun is not shining there, you better make sure that the indirect light levels are above 200 foot candles. Right away, that's like, like, oh, that gives me something concrete to aim for. Absolutely. Right? So then the next part of the story is, <laughs> I would tell people this and they'd be like, how do I know if it's 200 foot? Do I need to buy a light meter? And I'm like, okay, okay. If you don't have a light meter, then I went back to the exercises and said, all right, I'm walking around with a light meter like a crazy person in my house. Like, <laughs> How, where am I standing in order to get 200 foot candles versus where am I standing in order to get 50 foot candles, huh. right? So the answer lies basically to how big your windows are and how close mm -hmm. you are to them. Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm not talking about sun shining through the window. I'm talking about when the sun is elsewhere, mm -hmm. it's just the open patch mm -hmm. of the sky or like, you know, buildings that reflect the light. That's what gives you the, the difference in the readings. And the really surprising part is that I just need to, like if I'm standing right in front of the window, you know what, we don't even have to, I don't have to do this hypothetically. I can just do this right now. Well, like, and you have an app for that too. Your houseplant journal, our HPJ, is it called? Light meter. People can do that if they don't have one of these little handy mm -hmm. tools that I know are pretty expensive. Well, well, I mean, this one in particular is like maybe 40 okay. or $50. Now, anyway, as bad as I thought. so like my arm is outstretched, right? You look so, like you're in a right here, room. And I think, are you surrounded yeah, yeah. by windows where you are? Yeah, yeah. so okay. it's like, it, it's a, there's windows all around me here. Yeah. So anyway, I'm over here. One, What's the number? I can't, it's, it's back. 65, 160, yeah, 170, it's, it's under 200. 
Right, it's under 200. So now watch how the number changes when I'm just bringing my arm back under a little one. farther, now back to here. 185, it, it's yeah, one. it's almost 200, it dropped. Right, so there was a 100 foot candle drop only within the length of my arm, which is to say that that's why when people ask me, where should I put my plant? I tell them, put it right in front of your largest window. I used to say, give it the widest yeah. possible view of the sky, only because literally every change in the angle of view of the sky will cause this big number drop, right? Wow. And the thing is, again, we can't, I can't feel this with my eyes. Like I cannot, even with the amount of times that I've measured light, I could not just look at an area and estimate the number. Like it's just, just that varied and your eyes just are not built to, to measure that difference, right? So then bright indirect light, what ends up happening with people is they get fixated on the word indirect and they think it means they can just avoid the sun entirely. The other mistake they make is they think anywhere in the room is fine. Yes. So immediately to correct this, I will say, put it right in front of your biggest window because that's the best possible. I'm not saying it's going to die for sure if you move it farther away. It's just going to be not as good as right in front. And then the second thing is now at some point of the day, the sun might come shining through. You need to take note of how long that's going to be. And you want to make sure that it's not longer than, if I'm just being general, roughly two or three hours. Anything more than that, if it's a south facing window, for example, if it's longer than that, then the ideal thing to do is to block it with a white sheer curtain, like a diffusing material. Like this is the same principle as why the hoop, like a hoop structure for gardens is good. Yes. Cause it's not a transparent thing. It's, it's meant to be a whitish kind yes. of diffusing material, right? Because those seedlings don't want 10,000 foot candles from the sun, they want you know, 5,000, right? So one layer of shade cloth cuts it in half, right? I love it. That's it's a, the same a great tip. That's so smart. Indoors, right? And I think maybe if I'm speaking to an audience who's used to gardening, like bringing these, I would call them more sound concepts into indoor plants, but then of course, adjusting for the actual, like called structural differences uh, mm -hmm. is helpful, right? So if I think about, outdoor lighting designation, full sun, part sun, shade. Those are all good designations because they are all based on the same measure of hours of duration of direct right. sun. But indoor lighting seems to be based on just your subjective impression of the brightness. Exactly. That's why it's so complicated, I think, for people. And the concept of that, yes, I could put my plant in maybe a room that gets no light for the low light namaker of a plant which is you know tough and as Daryl says that plant's just dying more slowly that you know some of our low light plants if you put them in a place yeah. that it has low light great question um that you just alluded to about the um sheer curtains but how about windows so uh there's a treatment on a window like if a double pane window or is there anything on glass that matt is asking uh, blocking things that affect your overall plant health so there I mean, the degree to which it actually affects your plants is, is very small, right? Of course, people who have different, like different coatings on their windows might have different transmission through of, of the light, whether it be direct sun or even just the indirect light, it will affect the, the, the frequencies of light that come in. However, in terms of how much it actually matters to your house plants, like unless your window is actually like a, let's say a dark amber kind of weird tinting, like right. any sort of generally transparent tinting, it, it should be fine. Okay. Um, yeah, that's sort of all I can say about that. And, and then also, it's it's a matter of like just kind of accepting. Well, if you can change your windows, I would suggest changing them to whatever is as clear yeah. as possible. But most people don't no. really are not going to go through the trouble of changing their windows. I haven't seen many tinted windows except when I lived in New York City. Some of the big yeah. apartment buildings did have some tinted windows. Maybe in Toronto too. That's some of the bigger apartment buildings exactly right so i live in a very condo heavy area and i am looking around saying like oh i wouldn't want to live in that one their, their yeah. window tinting is like a dark brown kind of tint like oh, i don't like that one think about that when you're looking for your next apartment you don't want tinted windows i know people now who look for places based on you know what kind of windows do i have for my house plant so i love that we're in that that phase of our world is that's if, how we go you know, if we, apartment shopping. we really want it to be like super super precise 
about like shopping for the windows, it's almost as if you were to say like, what DLI, like daily light integral do I get from this window? That's what I should be basing my, my measurement on. And of course, if you don't have the instrument to measure that, it's just basically how big is your window? Because the bigger, the better. And the more the windows, the better. The Got less it. obstructed, the better. Got it. So obviously, my next question was going to be, can you successfully grow house plants for a long time indoors without not, you know, supplementing the light? But I look at your plants there. I mean, I know you have a few supplemental lights, mm -hmm. but I mean, I think you can, right? Can't you successfully do it if you have nice big windows or are your plants just dying slow, more slowly so than others? If you have okay i'm gonna have to go back to using the light meter here and say like if you walk around with a light meter and the indirect light is in the range of like 400 mm -hmm. to 800 then i would say i've only ever seen that if your window is like floor to ceiling and i mean my ceiling is not even really that high but you know some people have like you know yep. much higher ceilings so you have floor to ceiling windows and the span is like the whole width of the wall some condos are like that uh, then you could probably grow almost any house plant right in front of those windows and they'll do great. Um, but of course, I do have plants, as you see, farther away. I even have some inside the room. Those ones are exclusively under mm -hmm. grow lights. Uh, and so basically what I do is when I measure the light, natural light is getting in the measly like 50 foot candles, and which is perfectly fine to see. but for a plant, even a snake plant, I wouldn't torture it like that. So for those guys, I would then decide, okay, I'm going to put a set of grow lights here and maybe set up a little shelf that they can all nice. live under. So tell me what you've learned. We were going to talk about the grow lights that you love, and I know that you still have some that you love, but tell me what you've learned over these last years about specific lighting for indoor, for houseplants. Yeah, so so I recently invested in one of these little thingies here, which is a, a spectrometer. Fancy. So you have the light meter, which just measures like the intensity of the light. Uh, next level up would be like the, the PAR meter, PPFD meters. And what I've come to realize is that they're just measuring the same light using a different, different mm -hmm. scorecard, if you will. So if you want to be really get into it, it's like the regular light meter measures the score of light having uh, yellow and red, I'm sorry, yellow and green light being mm -hmm. worth the most, worth the most meaning most sensitive to it. And then blue and red intensities drop off because your eye is not as sensitive to it as uh, uh, green and yellow. Then a PAR meter instead measures the same light, but it's just in a, in a box. So it's like red, all the, all the spectrum is equally weighted. They're all the same. They're all worth the same, right? Now with a spectrometer, I don't even care about that. I can just look at what the spectrum yeah. looks like and this meter tells me both the foot, like what this would be in foot candles and what this would be in, in PPFD. So let's just quickly, so like, this is the wow. spectrum of natural light coming through a window, all right? So then, then over here, this is like one of my grow oh. lights. Oh, interesting. Oh, and that looks Greek to me though. And this is like another grow light, a different color grow light. So, oh, let me let me do one. Uh... What what color light do you, do you think this one is? Let me guess, yeah. blue. <laughs> it's it's very blue, and there's also a little bit of red in here. A little right? bit of red, yeah. I see a yeah. little so bit it's, of red. It's one of these. It's one of these purple grow lights. I'll try and see if you can see it back there. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. So that looks like it. Basically, it, it, it's this, it's that light, like the, the spectrum of the light is sort of like the footprint of the light, or not, not a footprint, fingerprint of the light. It identifies the type of light, right? And so, as you can see, like the natural light has a nice, really even spectrum across. And then when you get to LED grow lights, you start to get like maybe, it's still a smooth kind of shape but it starts to be a little spiky in some places. And then if you get a, just a pure blue and red light, well, then now you're totally missing the middle part and it's yep. just, you know, spike in the blue and red. So all of this to say is like, what, what do my plants actually need? And, and when does this actually matter? So the, I'll go into exactly when it matters, which is that 
in, in the past when people grow certain types of plants, they want the plant to, in the vegetative phase, to grow like as big, like big in terms of mass, but also as compact as possible. Right. Now, through a lot of research, we figured out that if your blue is higher than your red, then that, that's what will cause the plant to grow in that shape. Versus if your red is higher than your blue, then the leaves could get bigger and that's like not as manageable for that crop, right? And, okay, that's for the, the vegetative phase. Then when it's time to get the plant to flower, Usually the, you want the red to be a little higher than the blue in order to kind of get really nice big flowers from, from certain plants. So then you switch the type of light to you use when it's time to get them to flower. And then that's when they signal to flower. Now, let me ask you for when I'm growing a Monstera, do I care about any of that stuff? Nope. No, it's all vegetative phase. Yep. It doesn't really matter. You're growing a pothos. It nope. doesn't matter at all. You're growing begonias. It doesn't matter at all, right? Like it's, you have to look at this from, from the perspective of like, what do I actually need? Of course, it's nice to know that these things exist, but if you, if you just want to grow Monstera in a, in a very kind of recreational manner, I just wanted to grow, then even a spectrum as ugly looking as, as fluorescent lights, like a, right now I just did all like natural light. I did two different LEDs and then a red and blue light. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, maybe later I can just run over and get my fluorescent light, but anyway, like, It'll, if you look at the, the spectrum of fluorescent light, it, it's like a weird, very spiky, like it's green and red and then a little tiny blue thing. And it's like, you realize that you can still grow a tropical houseplant with fluorescent lights because you remember a few years ago, grow lights were fluorescent lights. Right, that's right? all there were, no that's LEDs. Were. So before LEDs came around, the best technology for tropical plants was fluorescent. But unfortunately, that wasn't good enough to grow other types of plants that needed to flower because not only was their like um, spectrum not uh, you know tuned for it, but it was also too weak yeah. to do it. But now with LEDs, you know you've seen some of these grow lights. Or I don't know if you've measured them, but like they can get up to like two thousand foot candles under them. Like I have a grow light right now, which is like if you can imagine four um, individual Oops. bulbs. Tubes, okay. yeah. yep. four T5 tubes that are inside like a housing. And underneath it, I was able to grow uh, some, some basil and, and peppers. I even got the pepper to grow to the point of flower, like, you know, yep. getting the actual yep. pepper. Now it wasn't a very big pepper, no. but it was still there, right? So uh, LED technology is like the godsend of, of you know, recreational houseplants. Because now you don't need to in, invest in like, huge i don't know if you've seen um what is it the high pressure sodium high intensity discharge lights like those lights from the from the 90s if you will are like old technology that that only really industrial applications needed the home yeah. grower is not going to use those right but with leds you can have little like things that you can I just know. plant to your wall or like you know they're just so cool and they're so adequate for, for pothos and, you know, smaller, these houseplants, right? So you say fluorescent, what about, I mean, a regular light bulb would not do, would not cut it. So, or would a regular light bulb, if I left a regular light bulb, you know, a, um, a screw in type? A screw in type light bulb, yeah, on a lamp. I mean, would that be a, a somewhat sufficient or do I need to step it up so a little bit? So in, in terms of, if it's an LED light bulb, like a screw in LED light bulb, then the only thing that matters is, Actually, it's not like, yeah, the only thing that matters is like how strong it is, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're reading the, the specifications for the bulb, um, you know, the, sometimes they might say like the, the lumen right. or the output yeah. of the bulb. Now, that, that just means though, it, in terms of relative to foot candles, what that means is that if it's 800 lumens, it means that the equivalent brightness is 800 candles but it's not a foot candle because the foot candle is talking about measuring it from a distance. Mm. Whereas 800 lumen means the whole bulb just throws out 800 all around. But in order to know how much your plants get, you need to turn it on and measure it at a certain distance. And then you'll get something like, you know, 400 or 200 or something. Interesting. Like that, right. So that's what you really need to measure for, for house plants. Again, if you're having more specific applications of like, you know, herbs or whatever, 
you know, you might want to do something with like a like two thousand foot candles kind of yes. kind of range. If you wanted to flower and all that stuff, but we're talking house plants. Okay, we yeah, don't want to get too professional. But that is so interesting. I mean, I love that uh, figuring out what you want for your plants, and you don't have to buy these really super expensive lights. So mm -hmm. thank oh, you for that. Then, in terms of spectrum too, like we looked at the shape of the spectrum. Yeah. The the different spectrum spectra that you would get is only based on like the type of light. So LED has that kind of smooth curve with either a blue spike or a red spike, depending on like how they tune the LED. Uh, if you have fluorescent, then it's very kind of discrete spikes, mostly in green and red. Uh, if you have a purple colored light, then you're obviously only gonna get a blue and a red spike. So these kind of patterns, obviously you don't need to necessarily buy a spectrometer because if I just measured five different types of, like how many different types of light? There's tungsten, there's um, LED, there's purple LED, there's natural light. Like there's only a handful of different types of light that you can use, right? And so once you know what the spectrum looks like, then you don't really need to measure it. I mean, I just measure it because it's interesting. But... <laughs> well, thank goodness that you're doing it because I, this is stuff just goes way over my head. But Naomi's saying how much she's learning. So I know everyone is learning so much for, from you. And that's why you do the research. And that's why we follow you because we learn so much about what, what your engineer mind can digest. And then I'm just like, okay, so my biggest window, that's all. I just want a big window. <laughs> and, and I think what's also di different is that like, like I, I can do the research, but I'm not growing, like, like I'm not doing a grow op, for yeah. example. I'm I'm just growing recreational houseplants. So it's like, I know what the knowledge is, but then I also am able to say, okay, what do we actually need to care about yeah. at this level, right? So it's it's not it's about applying it in in a reasonable yeah. manner. I love that. Well, thank you. So we've, we're 45 minutes in and I want to know what plants you're excited about. What are your, I mean, we've talked a lot about Monstera and I know, you know, you have a, that beautiful specimen. So what other plants are you excited about? So I, I very recently uh, invested in um, starting with one of these, what's called like Ikea greenhouse cabinets. So mm -hmm. you, you get an Ikea glass kind of cabinet and then you just seal up the, the, the edges and stuff like that with some, some weather sealing uh, in order to keep the humidity inside. And then you put a bunch of, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call them rare aeroids, but that's sort of what people are going by. Like, you, you know, the, the anthuriums, the more, the more obscure, like philodendrons mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I put my Hoyas in there too. Um, but like this, it, it's sort of like having a, a cabinet of curiosities. Love and, it. The, the environmental controls are so uh, critical because now the cabinet, it, like everything has to be in, within the cabinet. So I got, you know, four grow lights in there to make sure that, and of course I measured it, everything is out nice and uh, of measured. Course. Um, now, instead of having a humidifier, I have like a little, just a jar of water with a little fish, um, you know, those like yeah. air bubbly thingies. Yeah, so I, I put one of those in there and I have some cuttings rooting in that jar of water, but, but, once I've sealed up the outsides, and of course put a temperature like a thermo uh, hygrometer in there, the the internal temperature stays when the lights are on around 25 degrees Celsius, and uh, roughly 60 to 70 wow. percent humidity. And that's there's no humidifier; it's just the jar of water, and of course like the moisture from all the. Where plants. is that? But once you. People are saying, "Can you show us? Have you posted that yet?" Uh, I have posted. Okay. Yes, I, I posted it. Yeah. Is that in the I, other room? It's in the room beside me. It's in, it's in my wife's office. <laughs> Everyone is like, show us, show us. Well, well, Daryl will post yeah. a picture. Well, uh, Let's see. And also, like, if you go to my website, Ikea Green, uh, like, houseplantjournal.com, uh, one of the more later articles is the Ikea Greenhouse Cabinet. Okay. Yeah. And, and so, basically, it's, the uh, yeah, just one of the cabinets, and it's got a couple of grow lights in there and, and different shelves. And uh, I just put a bunch of the those anthuriums and fill right, so let's try. I, um, I'm going to do this, share my screen real fast and see if we can, you can show oh, yeah. us that, can you see this? <laughs> nice. So, um, uh, this is what you're talking about. So you can yeah. still open it. Yeah. 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 You, yeah. You open it and then you can see on the bottom, on the bottom right here. I, I'm, I don't know if you can see, uh, you probably can't see my mouse, but anyway, at the bottom right of the cabinet, you see where there's a fern there. Yes. You see these two little black boxes yep. and those are 
two two different thermometer hygrometers. I'm a little bit obsessed with like precision, so I just want to make sure that you know the consist like they're consistent, right? So that tells me like what the temperature and humidity is, and then on the left, um, yeah, that that thing there is basically like yeah. a, a kind of square shaped jar of water, and inside it Bubbler. there's a little um, fish fish yeah. aerator kind of thing. Uh, it's connected to a pump that's underneath the, the entire cabinet. Wow. And you've got a little fan. Uh, actually, that little, bu yeah, that, that bulb there is actually another type of thermometer hygrometer. Oh, my goodness. So I know Homestead is going to make sure I mention they have lots of these mm -hmm. plants for you to stop in and pick up. Mm -hmm. um, well, that was fun. I'm glad I could share. Are there any, should I scroll down any pictures that close ups? Uh, or yeah, is you, that if you scroll down, you can just see sort of like, the the process I had to go through of yep. like drilling holes and measuring light yep. and sealing up this like you can see the yeah that that picture with the edge there like you can see right into there that there's a almost like a quarter inch gap between the door and the the frame yep. so you want to kind of make sure that's sealed up um, yeah and then like you know because it's meant to be like a, a piece of furniture you have to make sure your cords are all organized into sure. like a little wire organizing box and that makes everything look neat and tidy and luckily you have a lock. So you can make sure nobody gets in. <laughs> nobody can steal those <laughs> aeroids, which I mean, the prices are sometimes getting a little ridiculous. Uh, but uh, like, luckily, I had a friend who who sent me uh, kind of like a starter kit of a bunch of plants. Nice. Well, everyone, just can, maybe you could just show us around. Point your staghorn fir, maybe your pothos. Show us some of the plants because everyone just wants like a little sure. show and tell. Um, and I know. Do you have any carnivorous plants? I know there seem to be like really hot right now. People are talking about pitcher plants. Are you into those at all? I don't have any, but um, now that I have that cabinet, yeah. maybe I should try some. Because, like the humidity in there. Is, yeah. So actually, let's talk about humidity for just for a moment because like I sure. think a lot of times when we talk about humidity, it's it's always just the kind of generalized, oh, raise the humidity, raise the humidity. Just, just do it, right? But I can tell you that except for that cabinet, everywhere else that I grow plants is all just ambient humidity. And I mean, right now I have another one of these little things here and it's like 40, 45% humidity. And that's kind of high today for, for winter. Cause usually it's like 25, 30%. Um, and I, I, all the plants you see here, like you can see that I'm not limited in my, my choices. They all grow just fine with that humidity. And even a maidenhair fern that I have over by a grow light, uh, has been growing all these past few months um, at ambient humidity, as long as you just keep up with the watering. And so it's like, I think that the idea of raising humidity is almost like to play into people's idea that, oh, you can achieve perfection mm. by having high humidity. Now, admittedly, yes, the leaves generally look a bit nicer if you have a higher humidity, but if you make your light levels much higher with grow lights and such, then I think that uh, factor is like more important in getting nice leaves. Actually, talking about nice leaves. Like this, okay, so I'm gonna show you the not so Thank nice you. leaves first. Like this old silver Here, pothos, yes. like this, this old silver pothos, I, I'm gonna post a picture of this eventually soon from what it used to look like. Um, it was basically a languishing plant. I was like, ah, oh, this thing is starting to not look so good, right? So what I did was I took a bunch of cuttings and then I put it back here on the shelf right under grow light, 1000 foot candles for 12 hours. Okay. And just to give you an idea of the difference, natural light over here is like a hundred mm -hmm. foot candles. Well, we measured it together. We saw that, mm -hmm. right? So under the grow lights, a thousand foot candles and I'm leaving it on for 12 hours. And like now it's giving me leaves mm -hmm. like this. And again, beautiful, just ambient humidity. So it's not that the humidity will make it nice. It's really the light that drives everything. Interesting. To, to work better. Yeah. Thing. There we go. And Laura, there you go. That silver pothos is for you. <laughs> Laura, <laughs> yeah. happy that you grabbed a plant. Um, you can see Daryl's surrounded now, by try, plants I'll, and is always living. I move the computer a little bit because it's my whole computer here. I know. So that's your monstera. I think Laura, Laura, maybe and maybe other people, you could point to a few and tell us the names of them. Sure, sure. Like this one here is a monstera, uh, deliciosa, and right behind it i'm going to bring it over is a thai constellation so like the variegated monster right beautiful um, and then of course your stack and then uh, fern over your shoulder 
Yeah, Staghorn Fern, uh, definitely one of my favorites. Um, uh, well, bring over this one here. We're making Daryl work. Thank you. This one here, uh, mm -hmm. the beefsteak begonia. Love yeah, that. One, really one of my one of my like all time favorites. I used to have one. Well, it wasn't mine, but I took care of it at my old church. And yeah, it, it was like a propagation from my priest's family. So it's like, it's like, yeah, a very meaningful plant. And so now yeah. when my, another friend gave me this one, kind of reminded me of that. So I'm happy oh, that I, I have one of my own now. Love that. And those leaves, uh, the new growth is a little darker. Yeah, yeah, new, it's like almost black. Yeah, yeah the, new, the new growths here are like a kind of rusty purple, purpley oh. color. And then like, yeah, these, these ones here, yeah, they almost do look black in the camera. But like, to me, they're like a very, very dark, and deep uh, green. I love begonias. I feel like, um, you know, I mean, there's so many varieties, but that kind of textured or variegated foliage, I think is really fun. I mean, I love a green plant, but any kind of textured foliage is fun. Yeah, this, this one here is yeah. like the, uh, the begonia maculata or angel wing mm -hmm. begonia. Yeah, this, this one, <laughs> you can see that I didn't, I didn't stake it. So, which is why it's all flopped which over like cool. this. But I mean, it's, facing the window growing towards it. So I'm like, it's okay like that. And, and yeah. besides then again, the whole like long-term idea, which is that eventually I'm going to have to cut this and propagate a few more sticks. Right. And then once I cut it, because it's the cane begonia, it'll just keep growing from the, where I cut it. Beautiful. And guys, visit homestead you can see all kinds of cool and unusual plants i know they're getting shipments in every week of some of these rare plants and some plants that maybe if you're new or you're a beginner you don't want the new plant you don't want to invest in the thai constellation but you want a monstera yep. oh i can't believe you've been growing yeah that is amazing you've been you've posted that you've been having success with ferns now that you've had more time oh, yeah, at yeah. home so th this one like which is, uh, you know, technically called a rabbit's foot fern, but I think some people want to really change the name to like tarantula fern. I think that right? would be right. And, and so let me really scare you with the way that I planted this one, which is that I planted it inside <gasps> a hockey mask so that it looks like, you know, like a Medusa growing out of the guy's head. So it, it usually Amazing. So, it sits face down yeah. over there by the window. And then like, when I look at it this way, you can see that it's basically inside a hockey helmet. <laughs> But I love that. I mean, you got to have fun. And that's what this is all about is having fun with your plants, trying, testing out different lighting, humidity, moisture. I know, do you use moisture meters? I know Homestead just got a bunch of moisture meters in because it's a big issue with people, like you said, like watering your plants. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I personally don't uh, use moisture meter because I just use a chopstick to kind of feel yeah. like probe the deeper plants. And then if the plant is small enough, you, when you lift the pot, you can just kind of estimate yeah. Uh, the, the the wetness right now the thing with moisture meter that I will say is that um, when you have like a really big pot then it's good to kind of dig a bit deeper in order to know of course you can also just again use the chopstick but whatever yeah. you're comfortable with the point is like uh, knowing the point at which to water is is critical right because when, when I mean it goes back to the, my whole teaching about watering which is that you know it's not supposed to be a schedule for each plant. Like it's, it's supposed to be, you look at the soil and make the determination of whether or not to water it. And the determination is only based on three general strategies, which is one is water when it's completely dry. So snake plants, cacti, any of those, you're waiting until the soil is just bone dry before you water it again. Uh, next one is partially dry. So, down two inches or one inch, whatever, something in the middle. Uh, if, if you think about this like a gas tank, it's like at, at anywhere in like 50%, 40% saturation, then it's time to water again. Uh, versus keep evenly moist, that's your maidenhair fern yes. as a prime example. It's like you need to bring it back to saturation when it even gets to like 75%. If you let it go farther, that's when a maidenhair fern just totally yep. crisps up, right? Yep, that is a great point. And Purina is asking about the chopstick method, and you just talked about a gas can. And I think, I mean, I'm not, I don't change my oil, but it's the same as a dipstick in your oil. I mean, it's oh, that concept. Yeah. You're sticking a chopstick, and I don't think you have, she's asking to show. I doubt you have anything nearby, but you can do the same thing with your finger. You know, yeah. chopstick gets longer, so it depends on the size of your container or a moisture meter, you know, and if you really want to get technical. So the moisture meter will tell you at a distance, because that's the thing, the top of the soil will dry out faster. So mm -hmm. that's the reason why you use the check. 
on the chopstick or if you're sticking in muffins like if you're a baker that's why we stick a toothpick in muffins to see okay oh down a little bit further it's still uh, yeah, wet yeah. so your chopstick will be wet. a little damp yeah. right and that's like, why you say okay i'm not going to water it will so. stick to it you can see if it's a wooden chopstick you can easily see when it's a bit damp and that's sort of like your your uh the way you should assess it. And of course, remembering the three strategies, which is like, okay, if this is a plant where you need to keep it evenly moist, then don't wait until the soil is completely dry before you water yes. again, right? Versus snake plants, it's like, you know, you you don't need, you can, you can, well, the snake plant is easy enough to just lift the whole pot, like if it's small enough, right? You just lift it. You should understand what the weight of a fully dry sample of soil feels like. And then that's your sort of cue to water yes. again. It's all about the, the cue to water, not the schedule to water. Yes, I love that. That is great. Karina, maybe you're a baker and that helped you. Or maybe you're a mechanic and you understood the oil, the dipstick method. Either way, it's the same process that, I mean, a lot of our things from outside of gardening can be applied to gardening, whether it's indoor or out. We just have to be, you know, trust our instincts mm -hmm. sometimes too and not be afraid. Number one, Daryl taught us not be afraid to have imperfect plants. That yeah. decay is part of the natural life process. And I love that. Um, and then, you know, try something new. You know, you have these connections with your plants, but don't be afraid to try something new mm, wonderful we got so much in today in this chat almost hour long thank you so much for your time daryl that wraps us up for houseplant month um we are finished even though january is not quite over and homestead will have houseplants all year round but there visit homestead right now for that urban jungle um but for as far as our grow with katie live at homestead gardens that is it we'll be back next monday not with daryl but with joe lample to talk about starting seeds Maybe a little lesson for you, uh, for your peppers, although it sounds like you got it with your basil and your peppers. Um, I know so many people are into starting seeds. It is just getting more and more popular, and I think this is going to be a really fun year, and Joe will give us all the basics. I will say that, you know, I like to look at different areas of gardening as almost like different styles of music, and it's perfectly fine to get into all different styles and just to realize that, you know, whatever interests you about gardening, like it there's going to be lots of great knowledge from each different genre. Yes. I love that. That is so interesting and test it and try it out. Maybe you like the blues a little <laughs> more than you thought you did. Yeah, <laughs> so sure. thank you, Daryl. And thank you, Homestead Gardens. This program is put on part by our rewards program. So please become a member if you haven't already. Um, and Homestead, of course, their slogan is because life should be beautiful. So thank you so much, Daryl. I really appreciate your time and everybody out there. Thanks for your great questions and engagement. And we'll see you next Monday. Bye. Bye.